Any one person with saddled with all his flaws can't carry the day because he makes himself open to criticism by other people and taking advantage of the fact that even though we tend to be uh, susceptible to various uh, biases and fallacies, we're often much better at pointing out those same fallacies and biases in other people. It's a kind of hypocrisy, but a kind of hypocrisy that can be mobilized in communities that agree to things like free speech, open debate, peer review, checks and balances. One person's biases can keep another one's in check. So welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Steven Pinker. He is the Johnstone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. His work has focused on language, cognition, social relations, and, and, and more. Um, his books include, but aren't uh, limited to, The Blank Slate, um, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Enlightenment Now, The Stuff of Thought, um, and and also his most recent book, um, Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, uh, Why It Matters. He also has a variety of published articles. Um, feel free to add anything, but, that, but with that, welcome and, and thanks so much for being here, Professor Pinker. Thanks very much. Sweet. Um, so yeah, so today I really wanted to focus on your um, you, that, that recent book concerning rationality, which um, in preparation, actually, I got, I read most of it and it was... Um, quite an enjoyable read, um, and, and so while the, while the title more or less indicates what the book is about, you know, rationality. <laughs> um, I mean, first, do, do you mind kind of talking briefly about um, who you intend this book for and and what you attempted to achieve with it? The original rationale was uh, to explain a number of the norm, norm, normative models of reasoning, that is, uh, systems of inference that indicate how one ought to uh, reason to attain some goal, uh, including uh, logic, but also probability, uh, the uh, uh, theory of signal detection, or it's, uh, as it's otherwise known, it's uh, statistical decision theory, namely how to trade off misses and false alarms in making a decision with probabilistic information, game theory, correlation and causation, theory of rational choice or expected utility, a number of um, ways of, of uh, rational thinking that don't necessarily come naturally to us, that are the, the gift of an education, but that I had not seen explained in one course or between one pair of covers. The flip side of normative models on how one ought to reason are descriptive models of how we do reason, we being uh, human beings, sapiens, there is a well-known literature in cognitive psychology and behavioral economics of the common uh, biases and fallacies that, that humans are vulnerable to. And so identifying how we ought to reason and identifying how we often fall short of those standards of reasoning is uh, a, 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 are complementary things to explain. Uh, I mean, at, this, at the same time, I um, quickly realized when talking about the, uh, the idea of teaching a course in rationality, or, or I've been writing, writing a book, the initial question that I got was, uh, how can you explain the florid irrationality around us? Uh, why does humanity seem to be losing its mind? Why, well, why are people um, vulnerable to conspiracy theories, and paranormal woo-woo, and quack cures, fake news? make quite salient in the age of social media, especially when we suspect they may have affected the outcome of the presidential election. So I couldn't avoid the uh, additional challenge of uh, trying to make sense of the ways in which we often don't make sense. Yeah, good stuff. And, and you mentioned there, there sort of in, in passing that, I mean, as you, as you talk about in the book, rationality has something to do with 
um, achieving one's goals, right? Um, working to, so as to, to, um, to, well, achieve what you're looking to do. <laughs> um, well, in fact, it's hard to define rationality other than I, a, uh, means to an end, a way to pursue a goal as excuse me, David Hume, um, made clear. I think that's what he meant when he said reason uh, must be a slave to the passions. I think in context, you didn't mean, well, if it feels good, do it, throw caution to the wind and go ahead, blow your stack. Uh, hit. uh what, what I think he meant was that reasoning is a way to get from uh, A to B. And what the, what the B is depends on the uh, values and <laughs> goals of the uh, reasoner. So uh, the very definition of reason, I, I, uh, the way I, I put it, I, I actually had trouble finding a generally accepted definition of rationality. But what I ventured was it's the use of knowledge to attain a goal. <laughs> and the... Uh, the, the ways in which knowledge may be used to attain a goal is are, are specified by the various normative models that I then try to explain, namely logic, and probability, and uh, Bayes rule, signal detection theory, rational choice theory, deep theory, and so on. Right. Yeah, I'm on, I think I'm on the same page there regarding, you know, rationality is a sort of instrumental uh reasoning but a fair amount of people will say things like well th you can actually have just genuinely irrational goals like th the person who wants to spend all their time counting blades of grass for example um people think that's just an irrational goal to have um wh wh what do you make of that is that um right to well i i do think i think it is a legitimate question um namely, you don't have to accept all goals is, as uh, uh, e equally valuable. Um, I don't think it's uh, rational. Just rationality considered narrowly would not indicate why it's irrational to just count uh, blades of grass. But if you were to start off with uh, the goals that everyone uh, claims for themselves, namely to stay alive, to healthy, to be comfortable, to be uh, happy, to be loved, and then ask whether other goals uh, are uh, helping to develop that goal or rather uh, contravene uh, uh, pervert them, then one could say, granted, and again, this point goes back to Hume, there's nothing rational about preferring to be um, healthy than sick or comfortable than poor. But given that, yeah, we really do have those goals, let's put aside where they came from, presumably from uh, evolution or from any process that allows a complex agent to stay alive in the face of uh, entropy and all of the forces that would otherwise um, tear us apart. Uh, what do the other goals do in order to satisfy that goal or those goals? And counting blades of grass, it doesn't accomplish anything that makes you happier or healthier or more, more, more loved. It has costs in uh, time and opportunity costs taken away from other things. One could say it's irrational to pursue that goal simply because unquestionably we have other goals and it gets in the way of those goals. Right, that makes sense. But for, and, but for the person who really just that's their primary goal. <laughs> if, if such a person were to exist, then uh, then there would be no rational basis for um, for, for talking out of it. But given that if that person managed to make it to the point where he could count blades of grass, he, um, he he must have been well fed enough not to have not to have starved. He must have um, been educated enough to not account uh, he must be healthy enough to have time to, to, to count, count points of grass so he really is already committed to other more primary goals uh, which then raises the question is that goal consistent with what almost certainly have to be subordinate goals that is goals exist this is well known from artificial intelligence research goals exist in a 
um, go, uh, uh, some goal, superordinate goal hierarchy, many smaller goals can be means to the act of pursuing one big goal. And given that the big goal of staying alive and, and, and healthy is uh, pretty much not optional for any complex entity, then it follows that other goals, some goals may be judged in terms of how well they, how far along they take you toward uh, attaining that major goal. Good. Yeah. And, and thinking a little bit more um, precisely about rationality, would you think that um, rationality is assessed in terms of the outcomes or like the expected outcomes um, of, of, of the action? So, so for example, um, you know, a person might take some medicine, even if they don't have the relevant illness, um, because they think there's some chance that they have the illness and there's some chance that the, the, the medicine will, um, cure them if they do. Um, now as a matter of fact, they don't have the illness and it didn't make any difference. And, um, but you would still, that would still be rational in the sense, right? Cause the, um, expected outcome is, is, um, well, yes, and in fact, there is uh, a body of uh, of like uh, normative uh, uh, wisdom, the, the theory of rational choice or expected utility, originally from Von Neumann and that Morgenstern. And one of the chapters of rationality is devoted to explaining it. That specifies exactly that. <clears throat> Namely, well, actually, there are two chapters that are relevant to some decisions. There's uh, well, so actually, actually, three, if you don't like be backtracking. There's a theory of Bayesian um, reasoning, namely, how should we calibrate our degree of credence in a hypothesis to the strength of the evidence? There's the theory of rational choice or expected utility, namely, given our uh, values, our utility in the, in the jargon, how do we uh, ensure that they are? mutually consistent, but if you combine them, there arises the question of, uh, given that we are always uncertain, we, we never have 100% confidence in some hypothesis, but that we do have various goals, some things are, are, are more important to us than others, how do we set a decision cutoff or a criteria that, given our uncertainty, maximizes our expected utility? And that's the theory of uh, sometimes called signal detection, sometimes called statistical decision theory, right. sometimes called error management theory. Three different ways of uh, 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 laying out how to make a choice when under uh, uh, under uh, uncertainty and risk. Right. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to turn to some of that. Um... So there was some later chapters on some decision theory stuff, which I always find interesting. Um, but I do want to I do want to ask about something that comes up early on. You tie this connection between rationality and morality. Um, you know, morality perhaps sort of arises out of collective rationality, people working together to to guide their actions for the benefit of the group and the individual. Um, I guess uh, could you elaborate on your on your approach here of the connection between rationality and morality, and does it make morality a kind of subjective uh, conventional endeavor, or, or how would you think about here it? Again, a starting point uh, is uh, a uh, famous argument from, from you, namely uh, often summarized as "you can't go from it is to it ought," that uh, which one could interpret as saying that morality has no rational. At all, but of course, subsequent uh, uh, thinkers, including uh, Kant and uh, Bentham and Mill, in their different ways, sought to place morality on more of a, uh, a rational basis. And I think the way to reconcile them all is to, is to go back to, to the fact that each one of us claims for ourselves certain goals, such as being uh, alive and healthy and comfortable. And, loved. Uh, we are also social creatures, so our well-being depends on the actions of others. So we are bound to implore others to treat us in certain ways. Namely, uh, if I'm drowning and you could 
extend the branch to save me. Please do it. Uh, please don't uh, uh, harm my children. Just one of it. Um, many ways in which other people impinge on our welfare. And therefore, we urge them to take our interests into account. Right. Well, if you combine self-interest that any stable entity must have with sociality, the fact that our fates are interdependent, then we can't very well demand that other people treat us with a certain kind of consideration unless we are willing to treat them with the same consideration or else they, uh, we have no reason uh, to expect them to take us seriously. And some degree of impartiality of um, considering one's own interests to be uh, interchangeable with someone else's is really the, the basis of our moral systems. It's the basis of a utilitarian calculus in which everyone's interests get uh, uh, weighed the same. It's the basis for more deontological notions where you abstract the uh, uh, principle from your actions and uh, look to make it universal. Like universal can't mean it's not about me, but it's, uh, it's about everyone. And so the like, abstraction away from one's own interests to everyone's interests is something that is, in a sense, logically entailed. There's nothing special about the pronoun me uh, that distinguishes it from you. And so anything that I say about how things ought to be when it comes to me, I have to be willing to flip. Because after all, me and you flip every trip of conversation. There's a, another argument, more of a gate theoretic argument, that whenever there are ways to to uh, whenever there's an asymmetry between how easy it is to harm someone and how easy it is to help them or free them from harming them, we're really all better off if we help each other and we're free from harming each other than if it's a war all against all. And so even out of self-interest, I would rather live in a world in which murder and rape and robbery were, uh, were prohibited than to live in a world in which they were permitted. Because even though if you know, permitted, well, great, I can go up and rob people and, and rape them and kill them with their nuisances. On the other hand, they can do the same thing to me. And uh, so it's not a very good bargain. And they don't cancel each other out. The benefit that I get from robbing someone is uh, smaller than the cost that I incur in being robbed. As long as that is true for other harms, of course, it's even more true for harms mm -hmm. such as uh, murder and slavery and uh, exploitation. That I should willingly sign on to a regime in which none of us gets to exploit the other. We all are obligated to help each other. It's better for me and all and for you. Good. Um, yeah, I like the way you, you put that. And um, yeah, so just broadly in this in this book, you one thing you do is you explore many of the different failures of human reasoning and, and rationality. But also, you know, you look at some of the the successes and the ways that we are um, competent in, in, in rationality. Um, of course, humans aren't perfectly rational. They're not perfectly irrational either. Um, how optimistic are you about about human rationality broadly? Well, it's um... It's not so much a question of optimism, but of just assessing what you're good at, what well, you're not so good at, how you can get better. We are, I do reject the, uh, I think, some glib completion from the demonstrations on human fallacies that we are uh, basically an irrational species, that we respond reflexively to threats, that because we are descendants of hunter gatherers who are constantly at risk of getting eaten by leopards, and therefore we have to react uh, quickly and instinctively, uh, and, and uh, therefore rationality is a uh, thing to be yeah. on top of these different instincts. Now, that can't be right for another number of reasons, starting with what it's like to be a hunter-gatherer, like our, our uh, model of our ancestors, when they start off rational discussion of how the uh, Slav and the Kalahari Desert 
formerly called the Hidden Bushmen, um, eco living out of a uh, harsh desert. They do it with rationality. They track animals by the, their uh, hoofprints and are supported that they leave behind, engaging in equivalent lazy reasoning, uh, distinguishing correlation and causation, uh, critical thinking. In particular, the last thing you want to do when you spot a predator is just to, to run, because that is just triggered the chase reflex in predators like lions. So even when it comes to immediate danger, our ancestors had to uh, rely on, on their, uh, their wits and their uh, thinking, not just uh, the reflex, reflexive response. But also, how can we even say that humans are irrational without some benchmark of rationality? Humans fall short, and who discovered these benchmarks of rationality if not for human beings? So, unless logicians, philosophers, mathematicians, are some superior breed of human, the uh, capability of being rational has to be present in all of us, and that even if it is, it is not developed. And despite the conspiracy theories and paranormal beliefs that are all too uh, uh, ideas to us. We need to keep in mind that they have always been, been with us part of human history. One of, one of the miracles in scripture, if not fake news about paranormal phenomena. And we know conspiracy theories have driven many horrible uh, events in human history, like pogroms and ethnic riots and wars. Uh, and just because something that is happening now does not itself mean that it's been getting worse. This is a lesson that I learned and tried to share after writing two previous books, The Better Angels mm -hmm. of Our Nature and Life Now, in which I not uh, uh, the some of uh, human well being, harm, uh, ultimate uh, deaths, uh, warfare, deaths, uh, homicide, uh, famine deaths. Undernourishment, child mortality, maternal mortality, and found that virtually all of the trends show improvement, much of which was invisible to us as we lived through them. Because we, as long as bad things happen, banished from the face of the earth, they'll always be down to fill the news. So we're aware of them, we're not sure they take place. It's easy to conclude from the fact that something is available in the news that it must be prevalent, perhaps even that it's getting worse. It's the availability bias, which is one of the uh, classic biases of transmit decision A, discovered by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. But it can fool us into thinking things are getting worse, whereas in fact the, uh, the, 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 the terrible things are always been with us. We just uh, don't remember the ones that happened in the past as vividly as the ones that are uh, ongoing. Yeah. So another thing you discuss in the book that you've that you've mentioned uh, at points already here is um, the significance of Bayesian reasoning. Um, without getting too much of the details, you know, Bayesian reasoning is is a way to, well, that enables us to update our beliefs according with the evidence that we have. Um, it's kind of a mathematically more precise way to think about that. Um, and in some ways, people tend to engage in this sort of reasoning kind of intuitively. But there's also a lot of failures. Um, can you talk a bit more about Bayesian reasoning and, and why um, people some, sometimes fail at it? Yeah, um, Bayesian reasoning, named after the uh, eponymous Bayes rule of Reverend Thomas Bayes, is a, uh, a way of calibrating your degree of credence in a hypothesis according to the strength of the evidence. And it's really based on one insight, and that is that you can tr treat degree of belief in a hypothesis as a probability as a number between zero and one, then the laws of conditional probability, uh, when uh, if you conceptualize evidence as being conditional on the truth of the hypothesis, namely, if the idea, such and such an idea were true, what are the chances that the following evidence would be manifest? Well, the, the theorem is simply cranking through um, some uh, manipulations of the, the the definition of conditional probability. So what it means in uh, to to render it uh, more intuitive to convey it without using symbols, just that the degree to which you believe a hypothesis 
based on some evidence. It can be calculated out of three quantities. <coughs> Pardon me. Start with the priors, namely the how credible the hypothesis was before you even looked at the evidence. In the case of, say, um, the chances that someone has a disease, it would be the prevalence or base rate of the disease in the population before you know anything about the patient's so, uh, symptoms or test results. Multiply that by the likelihood, which is if the hypothesis is true, what are the chances that you would see the evidence you're seeing? And divide that by how common the evidence is across the board. If uh, a symptom, for example, is produced by many diseases like headaches, achiness, uh, back pain, then if a particular disease has headaches, achiness, and back pain as its symptoms, you wouldn't leap to the conclusion that the patient has that disease because so many other diseases could have it as well. So that's the, um, the, the uh, conceptual basis of um, Bayesian reasoning. The, uh, there are conspicuous failures of Bayesian reasoning that have been demonstrated in the research program of Tversky and Kahneman and other researchers on, in judgment and, and uh, decision-making, where people instead seem, seem to reason by stereotype, what, what Tversky and Kahneman call representativeness. So, for example, if I tell you that um, Penelope is a, um, uh, has a finely developed aesthetic sense, she uh, make, makes her own clothing, she um, wrote a sonnet for her boyfriend for, as a birthday present, she likes to spend uh, summers in the, uh, in, the, in the scenic hills of uh, Tuscany. Um, what do you think? She's a college student. What do you think her major is? is it, um, what are the chances that she's a fine arts major, uh, sorry, an art history major versus a psychology major? And most people say, well, art history major, of course. Not taking into account that there are probably 100 psychology majors for every art history major, so that the... Uh, no matter how much her, her stereotype resembles the stereotype of a fine art, of an art history major, just the sheer base rate would lean toward her being a psychology major in defiance of the stereotype. But we tend not to defy stereotypes, and we don't take into account actual prevalence, and that sets us up for a uh, variety of fallacies. Another example is the advice given to medical students if you hear hoofbeats outside the window, don't turn around and expect to see a zebra. Um, medical students are, um, uh, are, are famous or infamous, perhaps unjustly, for diagnosing some, the, uh, some uh, rare or exotic disease that they just learned about in the medical textbooks, not taking into account the uh, prevalence of different kinds of disease in their uh, locations. Right, good, yeah, and so thinking kind of more carefully about those base rates, using Bayes' rule um, can help to avoid some of those uh, potential pitfalls of, of, of reasoning that we often fall in, right? And again, not to not to fall into uh, Humeolatry, but uh, David Hume, who's a contemporary of Bayes, anticipated a kind of Bayesian reasoning in his argument of why we shouldn't believe in miracles even if someone uh, convincingly testified that he saw one, uh, he uh, basically appealed to, to priors, given how much uh, evidence we have that the laws of, of uh, nature, as we understand them, are, are correct. Uh, what's more likely, that uh, all of those, the, the laws of nature are mistaken, or that some guy got something wrong? Uh, that is, the degree of belief in hypothesis should be conditioned by how likely it is a priori and not just by the latest evidence that we come across. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good example. I mean, and one thing you mentioned there is the, the priors. And I mean, this is a common issue that sometimes comes up is how do you determine your priors? I mean, sometimes it, I mean, you, know, you can get a grip by thinking about base rates, you know, um, look at um, relevant examples in some population, for example. Um, um, but I mean, in, in other cases, it's not always so easy. Um, and people might have radically different priors over something, say on the existence of miracles or, or, um, 
or whatever. I mean, what do you, what do you think about this? Is that just unavoidable or? Well, it, it's avoidable to, 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 it's unavoidable to a certain extent in that there is no one correct prior. That's even true in rather straightforward cases like medical diagnosis, where one has to decide whether the relevant prior is, say, the base rate for the disease in the whole population, or just the males, or just the males over 65, or just the Ashkenazi Jewish males over 65. Each one of those reference groups can give you a different base rate, and hence a different prior. Um, uh, and in, in uh, less quantifiable cases, then it arises even more dramatically, where you can't even put a number in terms of number of cases divided by number of um, opportunities or, or, or population. Still, Bayesian reasoning doesn't mean you can um, just set any old prior that you can believe anything you want, because then it would be pretty useless. I could just set my prior arbitrarily high or arbitrarily low, and then claim that I have that Bayesian reasoning leads me to any conclusion I want. There's got to be some grounding in the uh, prior in terms of everything that you know so far, the accumulated weight of evidence. Indeed, in a, a, a process sometimes called Bayesian updating, the posterior probability, namely your credence in a hypothesis after looking at the evidence at one time, can then become the prior for uh, assessing the probability at the next stage when new evidence comes in. Right. Yeah. Um, but at the end, like, I don't know, I think of people who, who have radically different priors on something like, I don't know, the existence of God. And um, when they try to <laughs> dispute, um, sometimes there's little progress can be made just because they're coming from very different or have a very different starting points regarding their, their credence in that. Um, and do you want to allow that that's kind of... Well, just no. I guess, I guess not. I mean, to, to some extent, that there, there can't be a precise answer, but it would be a mistake to equate prior with subjective conviction. That is how much I want to believe something. That is, there has to be some grounding in everything you know up to the point at which you are examining the new evidence that has come to light. And so the case has to, a case can be made or uh, as to uh, what the the prior is often the prior is, is not a single number but a distribution. That is, uh, the values could range from um, uh, uh, across a, a, a range of, of variables with a continuously varying probability in terms of what the value of that function is. Yeah, okay. F yeah, fair enough. Um, I did want to touch on something that's not super relevant to, to rationality, but comes up in the, you mentioned in the book and I find interesting. Um, you talk about um, family resemblance concepts and, and vagueness and certain issues that can arise from that. And um, would you say that as, as a result of concerns about vagueness, that there are some statements which are not precisely either true or false, or, or um, uh, do you have a view on that? Or Oh, yes. Well, when it comes to the, um, the, the predicates that correspond to English words, um, most of them probably are not exactly true or false, but are uh, have to be specified with respect to some, some reference, uh, or just inherently vague. If we say, um, you know, Bob is tall, uh, or or Jim is bald, then uh, there could be uh, a degrees of applicability, uh, depending on how far along they are on, on the scale. That is, there's a precise cutoff as to how tall you have to be before you're considered tall, uh, or how bald you are. Uh, their even category membership. Uh, can be um, uh, fuzzy. In many cases, is something a vegetable? Well, people might disagree over you know, garlic or uh, parsley, for example, whereas they're perfectly confident about celery or uh, uh, rutabaga. Uh, even then, beets, uh, beets, fruits, or vegetables, well, in some ways, they're, 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 they, they can be some of each because they're sort of sweet. Maybe people would call them a fruit or a tomato uh, because it's the 
fruiting part of the plant, even though it's more likely to be served in savory dishes than sweet ones. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, an insight that goes back to Wittgenstein in his characterization of games as lacking necessary and sufficient conditions that stipulate the boundaries precisely, but rather are a family resemblance where degree of membership is determined by how many traits the, uh, a particular activity shares with others that we are willing to call games. Right. Yeah, good. I mean, yeah. Um, I think of those cases like, you know, the classic varieties cases, like uh, um, some man that has some number of hairs, and the question is, is he bald or not? And then you can have a sort of sequence of them. You know, it's not really precise facts of the matter. You can, you know, the term, the, the category might be more or less applicable to him, and um, maybe that's all there is to, to, to say about that, um, at that level. Um, Turns out that Wittgenstein might have been wrong about games, that there is a definition of game that it is the, an activity that involves the uh, overcoming of unnecessary obstacles. Um, and there is a, actually a philosopher who came up with that definition, Wittgenstein to the contrary notwithstanding, whose uh, name just escaped me, but I would, uh, if, if, if it mattered to anyone, I could look it up on my, uh, my, my uh, file base very quickly. But the name is uh, in my current COVID state. It is not uh, uh, at my fingertips. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I do want to to if you want you can take them, but I do want to cover a, a few other things. Um, as you as you said earlier, we talked a little bit about um, expected utility and 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 how that comes into decision theory and stuff like that. Um, there's a few different ways to, to think about expected utility, maybe a formula of expected utility. Um, you know, there was Savage and his axioms, and then you had Jeffrey and evidential decision theory, and then causal decision theory. I don't, I, I, do you think much about all those more, um, precise ways to think about, um, decision theory or? Well, yes, I, well, in rationality, I, I explained the, um, the, the, uh, theory of von Neumann and, and um, Morgenstern. Um, although I, the the um, eight or so axioms that they proposed can be lumped and split in different ways, and the formulation that I presented was closer to Savage's than to their original one. I, since a lot of them were fairly abstruse, and I was writing for a general audience of, of students and curious nonfiction readers, I wanted the axioms to be. Uh, statable in a way that they could be translated into everyday examples. So uh, and I found Savage's formulation to be a little more uh, congenial in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the um, like what's called evidential decision theory where it's uh, there's um, uh, Richard Jeffrey came up with the system. It's pretty basic, but the the I think the key difference is you have to incorporate um, the likelihood of a particular outcome conditional on your action um, into into your utility calculus, um, rather than just like the likelihood of all the actions multiplied by the by the uh, some utility um, the preference ordering. Um, are you, are you familiar with uh, um, uh, Newcomb's problem <laughs> when it comes to Newcomb's the, the the paradox, the one box versus two box? Yeah, yeah, I can state it if you want, or for the audience. Yeah, so there's 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 two boxes in a room. One of them is transparent, and you can see that it has thousand dollars in it. The other box is opaque. Um, you can't see what's in it, but you know that it either has nothing or a million dollars. And your choice is to either take um, both of the boxes, and you can keep the contents of, of, of both of them, or take only the opaque box and, and keep the contents of only of that one. There's one catch. Um, you're also told that there's this very reliable predictor, which predicted which choice you would make, either take one box or both. And if it predicted that you would take both, it put nothing in the opaque box. 
And if it predicted that you would take only the opaque box, you put a million dollars in the opaque box. Um, and suppose it's like 95% reliable in its predictions. Um, in fact, I think it was supposed to be even more reliable than that, as I recall. But let's say it's 9.9%. 9 .9%. Let's, uh, let's up the ante. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the question is, um, well, what's, what's more rational or, or what option would you take? Um, just taking the opaque box or, or taking both the opaque box and the transparent box? Yeah, I mean, and the interesting thing is that, that it actually divides people. Um, there are one boxers and two boxers. Uh, for for me, it's a, a no brainer that you got the the, uh, uh, the 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 present can't affect the, the past, and so you you take both. So I'm a, I'm a two boxer. Um, moreover, I am astonished and incredulous that anyone could be a one boxer, but a lot of people are, and they're astonished and incredulous that, that someone like me could be a two boxer. So it's a, a pretty good uh, revealer of some kind of in intuition. Perhaps it's openness to the presence that human choice could be predicted with um, uh, even 95% accuracy to say nothing of 99.9% .9 accuracy. Uh, but e either way, since uh, causation is, 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 is one way, uh, as long as the, um, the, as long as the, the, the demon wasn't infallible, and, uh, and in fact, if the demon uh, was infallible, then there'd be no basis for saying you had a choice at all. It, basically, you, you, the question would not arise because the information available to the demon was so uh, determinative of what you chose that it's almost meaningless to ask you to to make a choice it's already been made uh that's that's the inherent tension in the rather absurd premises of the thought experiment but what uh what i find revealing about it is that it does unmask a surprising clash of intuitions with e each side incredulous that the other doesn't agree with them yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, I, I have to admit, I'm 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 a fairly convinced one boxer in this in this case. Um, no, I, I'm just thinking, not necessarily in terms of causation, but what's likely to obtain um, given the actions that I might perform. Well, maybe this is where I, I guess I'm not I'm not familiar enough with Jeffrey's um, theory to know whether it, it applies. But if since the relevant calculation is what happens going forward, contingent on my choices now. Then um, what the what the demon predicted is irrelevant. He did what he did. It's there, and, and uh, therefore it's there for the taking. Right. Well, in the in the Jeffrey um, formulation, uh, the the one the one boxer solution kind of falls out. To get the two boxer solution, you need something else or to, to modify it in some way. Um, What's become popular now is with certain forms of "quote unquote" causal decision theory, um, which uh, take into account those causal facts. You know that you can't affect the past; it's kind of fixed, and then you kind of um, you can get some sort of dominance argument running or something like that to for the two boxing solution. I, I would say, yeah, it is. It's a classic dominance argument, right? Um, although, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you maybe you're aware of this this the significant literature on this and. Um, oh, yes. one response is to say, I don't accept the, the dominance argument in the case where they're, um, they're statistically, they're correlated. Um, you know, you wouldn't accept the dominance argument in where, in which the outcomes were, um, causally connected to your, your choice. Um, so I think, I think there was a common critique of certain, uh, of, 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 um, of Savage, which you could have this example where, um, you're considering whether to take some preventative medicine, um, and for some disease. Now, like maybe there's four outcomes here. You take the medicine and you don't get the disease. You take the medicine, you do get the disease. You don't take the medicine, you don't get the disease. You don't take the medicine, you do get the disease. And it turns out that, um, in the case where you don't get the disease, um, well, it was better that you didn't take the medicine because that, maybe that's some cost. In the case where you do get the disease, um, it's better that you didn't take the medicine because, again, that's some cost. And so people might reason, well, I might as well not take the medicine because it's a cost either way. 
Um, that's a sort of dominance argument that most people would reject because whether you take the medicine is causally connected to whether you get the disease in some way. This is a preventive medicine or a curative medicine? Yeah, preventative. Um, like a vaccine? Yeah, exactly. Um, so you could use that example of, with a vaccine. As you might say, well, I'm going to get, either I do get the the um, um, uh, the virus or I don't, right? If I do get it, well, I'd rather um, not have taken the vaccine because that's some cost to me. If I don't get the virus, then again, I'd rather not have taken it because that's some cost to me. So, um, But of course, whether you take the medicine now has some effect on whether you get the uh, whether you take the vaccine has some effect on whether you get the, the virus. And so people would reject that sort of dominance argument. And some people, I think myself included, would want to extend that to not just events which are causally connected in this way, but events which are sort of like probabilistically connected, right? When there's some correlation between them. I guess I'm not seeing how the how dominance applies there. I would think it would be more of a case of statistical decision theory or single detection theory, namely if you were to quantify the uh, expected value of each course of action, namely the probability times the, the cost or benefit and, and, and sum them, um, and then you applied a, uh, and then the costs of each of the four uh, logical possible outcomes, namely you're, uh, you're, you're vaccinated uh, or, or you're not, and you are exposed to the disease or not, then um, the uh, well, I guess the um, the cells would be yeah. You take the vaccine and it's effective. You take the vaccine and it's ineffective. You don't take the vaccine and you come down with the disease. You don't take the vaccine. Um, turns out you didn't get the dis disease. Uh, nonetheless, that you multiply those probabilities by the. Um, uh, by, by the costs of being sick or being well, and uh, choose along with a higher expected utility would be the uh, would, would seem to be the, the way to go. And uh, the the answer would not be one of strict dominance, as far as I can tell. Um, but I haven't seen that example by Savage, so I probably shouldn't express too firm an opinion. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I, I have seen this come up as a, as a. Uh critique of, of certain decision rules that don't take into account um, these causal connections or the or at least the likelihood of some outcome conditional on the action um, uh, because you can run a sort of um, oh, maybe I'm not expressing it the, the clearest way right now you can run a sort of dominance argument um, in favor of it's almost like a fatalistic conclusion right to, to not do anything or to not get the vaccine because um, uh, well, either you don't end up getting the, the, um, virus, in which case better that you didn't take the vaccine or you do end up getting the virus, in which case better that you don't take the vaccine. Either way, it's better that you don't take the vaccine. And so, yeah, I guess I'll, I guess I'm not following since the probabilities are so different in the two cases. So it would seem to be an argument against fatalism in that what you do can radically change the odds. But maybe I'm not understanding it. You know, but I'm, yeah, but you're right to point that out, but that, that's what's wrong with this, this dominance argument applied here, right? Because we're ignoring the, the actual probabilities involved, the correlation between what you do and the, and whether you more likely to get the, um, the, the, the disease. Um, and the, yeah, so the connection between that and, and, um, what I might say about Newcomb's problem or even, like things like the prisoner's dilemma, where you expect your behaviors to, to correlate, um, is that, yeah, well, it's true that um, if I take one box, um, um, in some sense, taking both boxes dominates taking one box um, because there's all the money in the room. <laughs> I can take that if I take both, um, or I'll take $1,000 less if I take one. Um, holding fixed the amount of money in the room, although that's a bit controversial. Um, the point is that um, I don't want to apply this dominance argument when what is in the boxes correlates with what choice that I make. Um, 
right? So I, I think very likely if, yeah. Correlates, but, but, but absolutely cannot cause. Right. Cannot cause, yeah. Right. I mean, talk about a correlation not implying causation. <laughs> right. Yeah. But anyway, it is, I mean, it, it is a peculiar paradox, as I mentioned, because it divides intuition so starkly, but also because there's something that's inherently self-contradictory about the premises, namely your choice has been, um, is so determined that the, the demon uh, knows what you'll pick or 90, you know, 99% of the time. And yet the problem is, okay, go ahead, choose. It's up to you. Mm. Uh, so there's a, uh, anyway, maybe we've talked enough about New Newcomb's paradox. Something that, by the way, I, I don't discuss in, uh, in rationality as it happens. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. It's just, I had to ask because it's something I find so yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, some, something, a couple of things you discussed toward the end. W one is that, um, well, as you mentioned, this causation and correlation, and y you're sensitive to, um, I mean, as a, a, a fan of human, it seems, uh, certain concerns regarding what, uh, how to think about causation. Um, and I know you, you discussed like the counterfactual condition maybe um, as, a, as a way to think about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, what, what do you, what, how would you construe causation and is that something really integral to, to rationality um uh it it, it is uh, integral to, to to rationality there's the just the practical notion of how do you distinguish correlation from causation um we all uh so uh we we could all appreciate for example that uh uh i i told an old joke from my grand grandfather about the man who gorged on uh beaten stew and uh, tea, and then lay moaning in bed, saying that the tea made him sick. Um, now, Brazil yet to be born in uh, Warsaw in 1900 to find it as uproarious as he did, but if you can get the joke at all, then you can see that the distinction between correlation and causation is part of our common sense. And we don't want to um, take a, a drug with possibly risky side effects if it turns out that there's uh, we have reason to believe that it ha has no bearing on uh, making us better, but that all the reports that it did in the past just came from people who would have gotten better even if they hadn't taken the drug. So it, it matters. We care. It's often difficult to tease them apart in practice, and, and some of the cutting-edge methods in social science attempt to do so, and I discuss some of them in uh, rationality. Uh, the question of what exactly do we mean by causality, uh, by causation, uh, even if we know that it's whatever it is, it's something above and beyond correlation, but what is that something is uh, a, 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 a weighty problem. It, supporting a counterfactual is uh, part of it, but there's also an intuition that we have that there's some kind of mechanism, some sort of uh, oomph or, or force, literal or, or metaphorical, uh, some greater law of nature that is sub subsumed by the application of the cause in this particular instance, or that it, that subsumes, I should say, not as is, is subsumed by. And that's reflected in our language, the, uh, the difference between um, a causative verb, like to, um, uh, to, to melt or to break, and a phrase like to make something break or to make something uh, melt reflects our notion of whether there is some kind of um, transfer of, of, of force or power or, or oomph that's fairly uh, direct. Uh, so we can say um, Lisa dimmed the lights if she went over and um, slid a switch, but if she uh, turned on the toaster and caused the lights to, to dim, We'd be unlikely to say she dimmed the, the lights, she, but we might say she she uh, caused the lights to dim. So that kind of directness of impingement is at least part of our intuitive notion of causation. And both of those are distinguished still from mere correlation, such as if she uh, flicked a switch and by a coincidence there was a brownout in the city at that time, that would be neither direct nor indirect causation. 
Yeah, good. I, I think that's helpful. I mean, it can get more complicated, though. I mean, I think of cases where we might want to say something like, I don't know, some collection of people voting in some election caused a particular candidate to win. Um, now that's a kind of um, more complicated notion of a, a, a sort of cause, which doesn't involve, you know, these intuitive, um, you know, pushings and pullings or other more direct things like we might be talking about. Um, but still, we want to apply that language there. Um, I don't know. Do you think there's a lot more that we can say to, to capture cases like that? Or is it just really difficult? Well, psychologically, this is actually something that I explore in greater depth in my book, The Stuff of Thought, Language as a Window into Human Nature. Uh, even there, you'd see as a kind of metaphorical extension of the notion of force in uh, much more abstract cases of causation. You can say something like he, uh, his candidacy resisted the, um, the, the force of the over 50 voters and, he, and, and withstood it and uh, prevailed nonetheless, where uh, a lot of the verbs and nouns seem to allude metaphorically to a um, uh, 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 an agonist that proceeds on a course, an antagonist that um, potentiates or or blocks uh, its progression, and a whole set of uh, linguistic constructions falls out of that metaphor. But that's taking us a bit far afield of uh, what is our best understanding of uh, actual causation versus correlation. It's kind of the folk or intuitive notion that uh, is not unrelated to our best understanding, but it's not the same as it either. All right. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so yeah, just a couple a couple of questions to, uh, before we finish off. Um, so yeah, just a kind of general question. How can... How could people, I guess, individually and then collectively try to improve in their in their rationality, become more rational as as, as people? It it um, it helps to um, I think have been tutored in these cognitive tools or or normative models, and that's what I tried to do in in uh, rationally. What I try to do in my teaching, namely just being aware of um, Bayes' rule. Being aware of um, a kind of the game theory, game theory way of looking at, at the world, being aware of um, what probability is of, of uh, logic, can help, help. Can sometimes stop us short and and uh, make us think twice about some otherwise compelling but fallacious uh, line of argument. So that helps. But since none of us can ever aspire to be perfectly rational. It also depends on both norms and institutions. Norms um, such as uh, what are sometimes called principles of critical thinking don't argue from uh, anecdote, from a single example, don't uh, argue from stereotype, but consider the base rate, don't attack a straw version of an argument that you're opposing, but try to set up the strongest possible one and argue against that. That is, you, you steel man an argument instead of straw manning. Uh, and these are all uh, um, canons of the, the, the self-described rationality community who try to make it a, a habit and a set of mores and just things that respectable people uh, do or don't do in, in everyday arguments. And it, it would be good if those norms apply to all of our debates in political debates, uh, op-ed pages, comments and blogs, just as a set of um, standards as to what a, a decent person does or doesn't do. But perhaps most important, we have to submit to institutions that, that, that impose um, rules of um, intellectual engagement that um, make the the entire community more rational than any of them can hope to be individually. That is ways in which, despite our various flaws, we can um, uh, we, we can bumble our way toward the truth. So by by that I mean uh, communities like science, with its demand for empirical testing 
and a peer review and open criticism. Journalism with its demand for editing and fact-checking and sourcing. Uh, liberal democracy with its commitment to free speech and freedom of the press and uh, open debate. Um, uh, governance with its demand for checks and balances. So cases in which any one person with saddled with all his flaws can't carry the day because he makes himself open to criticism by other people and taking advantage of the fact that even though we tend to be uh, susceptible to various uh, biases and fallacies, we're often much better at pointing out those same fallacies and biases in other people. It's a kind of hypocrisy, but a kind of hypocrisy that can be mobilized in communities that agree to things like free speech, open debate, peer review, checks and balances. One person's biases can keep another one's in check. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thanks, very well put. Um, uh, so yeah, so this is one final question. Um, <laughs> another kind of broad question. Um, although we've, I guess you've been already, already covering this uh, throughout. Why, why does rationality um, matter, right? I mean, to me, at least in one obvious sense, it matters because, well, it's it's concerned with effectively bringing about our ends, like what we're interested in, in uh, what we would prefer to have and so on. You know, if I desire to be healthy, thinking rationality, thinking rationally matters um, because, at least to me, it can help me more effectively achieve that goal. Um, is this how you would think about it, or is there more to, to, to the value of rationality than that? Well, it certainly is. That is, the, uh, the, lo the laws of logic and cause and effect are true whether you believe in them or not, and so they, they, they determine your fate. So you may as well grasp them the better to make decisions that will align with your incentives, and as you put it, they will get what you want. It's also a peculiar question because in the very act of asking the question, you're presupposing that rationality matters and that you're asking for a, a rational answer. That is, why according to standards that you and I and everyone else holds, um, is rationality important? Well, if you weren't already committed to rationality, why would you even seek reasons and why would you accept good ones and reject bad ones as opposed to say, just having a beauty contest or or threatening someone to mouth some words or bribing them, the very act of seeking reasons for anything means that you've already signed on to rationality as the ultimate way of determining which beliefs we, we ought to hold. So um, that, but once you do ask the question, once you do seek uh, a rational answer, as, as, as paradoxical as that is, then certainly the fact that rationality is almost by definition what gets you what you want, uh, applied thoroughly and consistently. Also, um, I, I add in the chapter what, why rationality matters, that it's uh, the application of rationality is behind the great material progress that our species has enjoyed, particularly since the Enlightenment, the fact that we have more than doubled our lifespan, we have decimated the rate of extreme poverty, we've reduced the toll of deaths from um, disease and famine, maternal mortality and child mortality. None of these happen by themselves. They, it's not as if the universe has some force that makes us better and better, quite the contrary. There are many things that make us worse and worse. Um, but it's only because our ancestors deployed their rationality to try to make us better off. So they invented things like antisepsis and um, uh, synthetic fertilizer and um, sanitation and vigorous hybrid crops and, and, and so on. Uh, I also argue a little less obviously that a lot of great moral movements began with a rational argument that um, uh, if you go back to the origins of feminism, of democracy, of the elimination of uh, cruel corporal and capital punishments of slavery, there were um, uh, thinkers, polemicists, philosophers, sometimes theologians, 
who advanced an argument that some practice of the day was inconsistent with values that people claimed to hold. And there are reasons to, to suspect that those arguments got the ball, ball rolling via the viral dissemination of pamphlets and, and, uh, and books, discussions in salons and pubs and, and coffee houses that would then influence uh, elites or, or the powerful and, uh, and affect real change triggered by a good argument in the, uh, uh, at the outset. Great stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll, um, on the questions there, um, I'll include, I'll include some, uh, links to the, the book. Again, the title being rationality, uh, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. Um, I know it's on Amazon as well as elsewhere. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks so much, Professor Pinker, for, for being here and taking the questions and, and providing your answers. It's been it's been great having you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Troy.